We're pleased to have Congressman Alan Grayson with us for the hour, taking your calls. Uh, Congressman Grayson, uh, who brilliantly represents Florida's 9th District, the congressman with guts, grayson.house.gov is the official website. Congressman, welcome. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased and honored to have you on the show, and thank you for being willing to take calls from our listeners. Uh, and, and if you want to talk to Congressman Grayson, we have a couple people already on, on hold waiting to talk to you. And if, if you'd like to talk to Congressman Grayson, just give us a shout. Congressman, I'd like to just open up, though, by inviting you to just go off on a rant. What, what do you see as the, the really significant and consequential issues that as a congressman you're dealing with or as a country we're dealing with or what you know whatever you, you think is the stuff that our listeners and our viewers really need to know about right now well the fundamental issue is inequality uh, sometimes it takes the form of social inequality racial inequality economic inequality sometimes generational inequality but that's what we grapple with inequality is spinning out of control in this country uh, it's gotten worse and worse since the 70s and the 80s and we haven't had a political system that was willing to come to grips with it or even look, look at that problem as, as a real problem. Uh, economic inequality in particular is as bad as it's ever been in this country. In some senses, it's worse than it was just before the Great Depression. Uh, and uh, it's leaving people with no sense of opportunity, with no sense that they'll ever be able to be all that they can be, uh, and that they'll, they'll forever be constrained by uh, cheap labor and wage slavery. Uh, the kind of system that multinational corporations are trying to set up in the United States as a form of perpetual, permanent exploitation. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that, that's how I see it. I, I know that's grim, uh, but there is hope. Uh, the hope is that we still are a functioning democracy. Uh, in some respects, we're heading toward an oligarchy. We have an oligarch running for president right now who's leading in the polls for the Republican Party. In some respects, you could call uh, this country a one that's in danger of becoming a plutocracy. Uh, but the fact is people still have their votes, and those votes are still meaningful. So as long as that's the case, we can elect better leaders, uh, leaders who will come to grips with what's happening in America right now and make sure that we don't see the death of the middle class. Yeah, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'd also like to very quickly get your thoughts on the TPP. I know that you've got a, uh, a, a website about trade, uh, trade treachery. Dot, do I have that right? Trade um, tre- TradeTreachery.com, yes, and I'm happy to tell you that that nine-minute video that we created to try to explain to people exactly what the TPP and what Fast Track are all about uh, has been remarkably successful in doing so. Uh, People hear about these abstract terms, these acronyms. They're actually uh, conscious efforts to obfuscate. Mm. Uh, They're Orwellian. When you hear the letters TPP, that doesn't connote anything to you. Uh, as, as opposed to uh, some of the, 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 uh, the jargon that's used uh, uh, by the, the right wing, for instance, the pro-life term. Right. So we, we, have, we have jargon that's used uh, to try to deceive, and we have jargon that's used to try to obfuscate. Well, trade is one of those issues that's full of obfuscation. The basic fact is that thanks to our failed trade policies of the past 20 years, we now owe foreigners $11 trillion dollars. That's approaching $40,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. Uh, I'd venture to say that if most of your audience had, oh, let's say a Chinese uh, leader or a Singaporean leader or a Saudi leader, just walk up to them in the street one day and say, I'd like my $40,000 back, and I'd like it right now, I think that most of your audience would utterly freak out. But that's the situation that we're already in. We're already at that point where we owe $11 trillion, not to ourselves, not where the poor owe it to the rich or Americans owe it to other Americans, but actually a situation where Americans owe to foreigners. Right. And this is not the federal trillion debt. Dollars. Yeah, this is, no, not, no. this is not the federal debt. This is our trade deficit. Right. If we had the political courage, we could take care of the federal debt the way that we did during the Clinton administration and simply tax people to help to pay that off. We. Right. And by the end of the Clinton administration, we're only seven years away from eliminating the federal debt entirely uh, until we uh, elected new leadership that put us further behind in that regard. Uh, but that's not this. This is fundamentally different from that. In order to pay off this debt, you literally have to in- indenture yourself uh, to, to foreign governments, foreign sovereign wealth funds, uh, foreign, uh, foreign individuals and foreign consumers, yeah. uh, and literally hand over to them $11 trillion of U.S. goods and services or $11 trillion of U.S. property. 
And think about it this way. The whole country is worth roughly 50 or $60 trillion, depending upon how you calculate it. That's the value of every building in the country, every car in the country, every stock, every bond, every mutual fund account, every 401k. Add it all together, it's 50 or $60 trillion. And we owe $11 trillion of that to foreigners already. That's where we are. And that's why the Trade Treachery video <clears throat> that we put together at TradeTreachery.com was so powerful, just laying out yeah. the facts for people in a systematic way. One million people have seen that video on Facebook alone. That's great. And the number grows every day. And That's great. the question, I guess, is what does that mean for current policy? Well, one thing it means is that we shouldn't make a bad situation worse. Uh, if Congress goes ahead and actually enacts the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there's a nice Orwellian term, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Well, don't we all like to be partners? Yes, that yeah. sounds nice. But the fact is that it greases the skids on the road to hell. Yeah, that's I, what it does. It yeah, I, I, I've renamed it. You know, follow, the NAFTA is North American Free Trade. CAFTA is the Central American Free Trade. I think this is the Southern Hemisphere Asian Free Trade. Uh, S H A F T A. SHAFTA. Yes, and we get the shaft. Yeah, that's exactly there you go. Right there, you go. So uh, let's let's pick up a call here. Lee in Verona, Oregon, because our board is totally full right now. People can't even call. we got 12 people in line. Lee, you're on the air with, with uh, Congressman Grayson. Yes. I'm in Vernonia, Oregon. And the question I have about PPP is I have both a senator, Democratic senator, Democratic representative, both of whom voted for Fast Track. And I want to know what elements of the TPP are most likely or are likely to be the most toxic to these Democratic senators and representatives, because I'm going to be working on them. Well, and one What one element thing is would really make them upset? I, I will you. tell you that you, you mentioned that uh, there were 18 Democratic members of the House and uh, a small handful of Democratic senators who actually went against the, the the party voting as a block against more free trade, so-called free trade giveaways, another Orwellian term, free trade. Everyone likes things that are free. Um, and, and in fact, <clears throat> one way that you could know that things have gone seriously awry is that the Trans-Pacific Partnership does not meet the tests for a trade deal that they promised to these representatives, to these senators, in order to get them to vote for the fast-track procedural giveaway. Fast-track basically says we can't amend it, we can't have <clears throat> too much time to vote on it. We can't debate it. We each get 88 seconds to vote to debate uh, the, this this new deal. And uh, it, basically, it's take it or leave it, and, and take it or leave it very quickly. Uh, that, that was based upon the administration promising <clears throat> that there'd be certain things in these deals that would be mandatory and enforceable, like protection of labor rights in these countries. We have countries that essentially engage in widespread slave labor. Um, there's nothing in TPP that protects uh, individuals. We, we have countries that uh, engage in widespread degradation of their environment uh, in order to be chief sources of particular goods. Yeah. Again, nothing enforceable that actually... Would yeah, protect. it's the enforceable part. I was reading the TPP yesterday, and in the forced labor section, it says we discourage the use of the manufacture of products using forced labor. Like, that's really going to stop Malaysia. Congressman Alan Grayson is with us. Grayson.house.gov is his website. Answering your questions for the hour. We'll be back with Congressman Grayson in just a moment. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And TradeTreachery.com is a great website also that's associated with Congressman Grayson. Stick around. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Anita watching Free Speech TV in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, Anita, you're on the air with uh, Congressman Alan Grayson. Hey, Tom. Hi, Congressman Grayson. It's an honor to speak to you. Um, I would like you. you to comment on the importance of uh, electing a Democrat to choose the next three, maybe four Supreme Court justices, because no matter what your issue, whether it's climate change or labor or reproductive rights or the voting right or voting rights, that is going to, that is going, the next Supreme Court is going to have something to do with those issues. And I worry that we don't, we're not keeping that in mind. 
Well, we're at an interesting point now regarding the court's history. I agree with you, and I think one way to un- to underscore that, to to emphasize that, is to recognize that there are four Supreme Court justices who are extremely unhappy with many of the decisions that have been made and have gone to an unprecedented length to express that. They specifically say that they would reverse some of the decisions that have been made if they have a fifth vote to do so. And the classic example of that is the Citizens United decision. After, in the Citizens United dissent, they indicated this is wrong. Uh, in a subsequent decision involving uh, the Montana state effort to reverse Citizens United as part of their constitution, those four dissenters came out and said that if they had a fifth vote, they will reverse Citizens United. Um, that's not the kind of talk that you normally hear from Supreme Court justices. Take it from me. Right. Uh, and what that does is underscore that both the risk that these four will be three or two uh, in, in the next presidency, if there's a Republican who's elected and he appoints or she appoints Supreme Court justices who are anti-democratic, <clears throat> or alternatively, the opportunity. There's an opportunity here that didn't exist before, which is that with four justices galvanized to try to right some of the wrongs that have been perpetrated by the Supreme Court in the last few years, there's an opportunity here that we should not let elude us. By the way, thanks for watching on Free Speech TV. Please let your friends know about it. Um, it's one of the, the hidden secrets of progressivism in America that should no longer be hidden or secret. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Diana, uh, in Agora Hills, California, watching Free Speech on Direct TV. You're on the air with Congressman Grayson. Thank you, Tom. It's an honor to speak to you both, and especially you, Tom, as always. Um, uh, Mr. Grayson, uh, you're one of my political heroes. I've been teaching college for over 26 years, and I can tell you uh, we all that are mature can worry about Supreme Court appointments and so forth, but I have known for a very long time working with college students that the institutional trust has collapsed in that young age group going all the way up to the 30-year-olds. There's just no faith in institutions anymore. So along comes Bernie, and there's tremendous restoration in the possibility of a politician actually being honest and progressive. So my question to you is, couldn't Bernie Sanders save the Democratic Party? Can't the Progressive Caucus actually come out and support him? So far, only Keith Ellison and Raul Okay, Diana, we've got only 20 seconds left before the break. Congressman? Well, the short answer is that Bernie is showing a way forward, and that is to debate the issues and debate them with truth and justice on your side. That's a wonderful accomplishment of his campaign that will never be forgotten, win or lose. Yeah, and and I think that he's going if to, he, if he wins, great. If he loses, he's going to go back to Congress, a very, very powerful person. Bernie, by the way, has been doing this one hour that you're doing right now on this program for 11 years. We will be right back with Congressman Alan Grayson, uh, representing the 9th District of Florida. Grayson.house.gov is his website. We'll be right back. Welcome back. 20 minutes past the hour is the Tom Harbin program. Congressman Alan Grayson answering your calls for this next hour. And Congressman, we got calls right now from Iowa, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Delaware, Illinois, California, Florida, Michigan, and New York on the line. So, Kurt. Well, in, Florida sounds good. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that one. Uh, but I just put Kurt from uh, West Des Moines, Iowa on the air. Kurt, uh, listening to Sirius XM, you're on the air with Congressman Grayson. Hi, Tom. Thanks for taking my call, Congressman Grayson. Really appreciate you filling in for Bernie. Uh, I've listened to you, Tom, and Bernie for the 11 years. It's, it's been a pleasure, and thank you, Congress, Congressman, for doing all you do. Um, before I ask my question, uh, I'd like to kind of relate uh, my story. Um, I'm from Michigan originally. I was an auto worker in 2007, laid off. Um, things weren't good, uh, as you guys all know. Um, our great governor, Granholm, uh, had a program for displaced auto workers, uh, no worker left behind. And with that, I was able to go back to school, and I um, became a wind turbine technician. I'm now working for a great company. Uh, we're producing green energy. I, I have a great job. Um, and uh, my job was created directly 
as a, a part of the production tax credit. Um, and now my question is, is can we get that production tax credit uh, permanent? Well, it's funny that you mentioned that. I Just this past week, I'm sure this is going to sound like someone planted you. Thank you, Kurt. Just this past week, I introduced a bill to do exactly that. Uh, I think it, the, given the current re- Republican regime, it's unlikely that we'll see a permanent extension. Uh, but my, I introduced two bills, one to extend it for one year and one to extend it for two years. Uh, and I think that's sort of the way things will go. Uh, I, I was successful last year. By the way, in the past two years, 15 Grayson bills have been passed by the House, passed by the Senate, and signed by the president into law. Wow. So more than any other member of Congress and, uh, by by a wide margin. And Marco actually. Rubio in his entire history has passed two pieces of legislation that uh, renamed post offices. Yes, and, and uh, our majority leader in the House, uh, <laughs> who wanted to step up and be the speaker, had exactly the same legislative record. Oh, well, maybe I, I, I might be wrong about Rubio then. I might have been thinking of Paul Ryan. I'm sorry. But, yeah, that, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, actually, I was, uh, I was referring to McCarthy. But oh, McCarthy, Kevin event, McCarthy, yeah. I might Kevin have been thinking McCarthy. of him. Yeah. But, but one of our successes was the fact that last year, uh, recognizing that as of December 31st, we were facing an expiration of the energy tax credit for new homes and the energy tax credit for existing homes, resales. Uh, a year earlier in January, I introduced a bill to extend those two, uh, and, and those two are extended uh, incorporating my bill without any changes whatsoever into larger legislation that included other provisions. Same words, same punctuation, same everything. Those two Grayson bills became the law of the land, and now we have an extension of those uh, two very important tax credits uh, in, for, you know, for an industry that Republicans have been very hostile to. Mm-hmm. Renewable energy is not uh, one of the Republicans' uh, favorite subjects. But nevertheless, making that case for, for the entire year from January through December last year, uh, I was able to get that extended, and I'm going to try to do so, the same thing with the credit that you've been referring to. It's very important, and in fact, it's, it's a pathway. It's an overused phrase, God knows, but it's a bridge to our future. Yeah. Uh, the fact is that renewable energy on its own, w- without the long-run subsidies, is well on its way to becoming uh, the future uh, of energy, uh, even at the low depressed prices that we're seeing right now for fossil fuels, uh, even at $2 a gallon. Uh, solar is becoming very formidable day after day, week after week. The same thing with wind energy, uh, other forms of renewable energy. And that, that gives us a clue as to what kind of energy will be consumed, what will be powering the world for our children and our grandchildren. There you go. Daniel in Arcadia, Florida. Here's your Florida call, Congressman. Uh, you're on the air with Congressman Alan Grayson. Ah, a voter. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Daniel. <laughs> Daniel? Oh, no, Daniel. Uh, we lost him. Well, yeah, apparently. Sometimes people just, you know. Let's vote some other way, then. Yeah, sometimes people forget that their phone is on mute, or sometimes they're watching their TV, and there's about a half a minute delay, and they miss that. So, anyhow, let's move along. He'll, he'll call back. Will in Blakesley, Pennsylvania, listening on Sirius XM. Will, you're on the air with Congressman Grayson. Hi, Tom, and hi, hi Representative Red Grayson. I love you both, you guys. Hey, real quick, uh, um, my, my wife, myself, and my daughter, we're in our 50s. She's. she's 29 are all going to go to our graves buried in debt. There is literally student loan debt, student loan debt. There is literally no way we could pay it off. It ain't going to happen. I, I've given up long ago. Um, I think I'm one of tens of millions of people. I really do. I think it's that huge in this country. Um, would you support a debt jubilee? Not lower the interest rate for student loan debt, but basically tell, tell banksters like Skank of America they can take their, their con jobs and they can, they can eat them. Would you support a debt jubilee? I've given it some thought. I do think of it from time to time. I'm not sure I'm willing to do that quite yet, but I do want to make sure all the listeners understand what we are referring to. Uh, In Leviticus, in the Bible, um, there is a provision that says that every seven years, uh, you don't have to pay interest on your debt. Uh, And the reason is that uh, that's, that's a year when people can actually enjoy themselves. And then every 49 or 50 years, depending upon how you read that provision, uh, there's a forgiveness of debt. Uh, we, uh, we, we uh, obviously are a debt-mired country. We're a debt-mired culture. Uh, that's true uh, just as much, actually, of our corporations uh, as it is of our individuals. And the question is, uh, over the long run, what does that mean? Uh, the, the Bible gives you a solution to that problem. It says that over the long run, over, at least once in a normal person's life, if you manage to live long enough for it, 
say that you're half a century old, at least once in your life, your your debt will be forgiven. Uh, and uh, which is that called a jubilee. That there's a an oppor- a jubilee. Yeah. That's an opportunity to start over economically. We don't have that in our law. We haven't had that in our law except for bankruptcy law uh, in in any part of our our culture. Well, would you support allowing bankruptcy to general. include student loans? Yes. So that's that, that would you know be a one person by person jubilee functionally, right? That is correct. Yeah. You're right about that, and and uh, that that you know the the, the the bankruptcy laws have been distorted by by private interests over the years uh, to make bankruptcy uh, uh, something other than a jubilee. Right. There's an exception for this, there's an exception for that, there's an exception for the other thing, and uh, the credit card companies in particular have been extremely effective yeah. about compromising the basic principle that. Under our laws, you can start over. I mean, one of... Congressman, hang on just a second. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 202-536-2370. Congressman Alan Grayson on the line answering your calls. We'll be back in about five minutes after the news at the bottom of the hour. Stick around. Welcome back to the program where we dare to ask, is Walmart a person or Hobby Lobby? And we dare to say no, no thank you. Not a chance. Congressman Alan Grayson on the line with us, taking your calls for the hour. Congressman, you're still with us? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Daniel, in Arcadia, Florida, you are on the air with you, with Congressman Grayson. At last. Hi, Alan Grayson. Uh, man, you make me so proud to be American and, and, and free and the home of the brave. Uh, I just I love the way you stand up to these third-way dams like that dropkick Murphy, dude. Um, you just make me so proud. We are about peace and freedom. And if you remind me of Roosevelt, I hope Bernie puts you in an attorney general to go after these banks. Yeah, we've had actually several people, uh, Congressman, over the years ask if uh, if Bernie became president, would he make you AG? Daniel, you had a question for the congressman? Yeah, uh, 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 Congressman Grayson, um, is there any way we can defeat the... the this disastrous TPP, disaster capitalism on steroids? Well, the answer is yes, and, and we have to if we're going to have a future for the Amer- American middle class. There, there is no alternative. We, we have to try to do it. Look, we came close. We had only 18 Democrats who flipped on the last vote. Uh, I think we'll see more Republicans lining up against it because, uh, frankly, uh, the Republican presidential candidates are going to be falling all over themselves in the next couple of debates, uh, pointing out what what the, the flaws are in the TPP, uh, because they they want to be anti-Obama, and this is one way to be anti-Obama. Their, whatever their motivations might be, the, the fact is that anyone who takes any amount of time looking at the thing recognizes how appalling it is. I mean, just to give you one example, uh, which has been public now for a while, even before they disclose the details of it, uh, this sets up a parallel court system uh, that, it, that is administered by the World Bank uh, and by the United Nations that is only open not to foreign corporate, not to foreign people, not to American people, not to American companies, but only, only to foreign corporations. And they can sue, and as Tom has publicized in his show well over the last few months and even the last few years, they can sue whenever we try to defend ourselves against them in a way that they seem to be impairing their ability to make the almighty dollar. So, for instance, if we have a safety regulation, they can sue. If we have an environmental regulation, they can sue. If we have a right to organize regulation, they can sue. And they can get money judgments against the federal government, the state governments, even municipal and county governments, whenever we try to defend ourselves against them. And, 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 and this is a system that is established by the TPP. And, and to make it even worse... Who are the judges in the system? Corporate lobbyists. Corporate lobbyists function as so-called arbitrators in the system, uh, and they can be representing foreign corporations in one case and pretending to be judges in a different case. It, it's a case, it's a system that is so utterly, obviously rife with abuse, and yet the president and, and these, these, the trade representative are more than happy to try to inflict it on us. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Doris in Palatine, Illinois, listening to WCPT in Chicago. Doris, you're on the air with Congressman Grayson. 
Uh, thank you, Tom, for taking me a call, and thank you, Congressman, for what you do. And I am glad I'm in Illinois, and in my district I have one of you, and it's uh, Tammy Duckworth. Uh, my question is, last night I saw on, uh, Rachel Maddow, um, Elizabeth Warren, wanting to present on the uh, floor a bill that would uh, close the loophole for the um, companies uh, giving their CEOs bonuses that we pay for or increases in pay and then uh, take that money and put it in the uh, COLA fund since, uh, and I'm a retiree, um, in, in, in that fund so that we get a, an a increase. I know very. I know exactly what you're talking about. We're introducing oh, the same bill in the House, uh, and I think we need to go even beyond that point. Uh, the cost of living adjustment system for seniors is broken. Uh, it's been broken for a long time. It needs to be fixed. Uh, among the bills that I've already introduced, not just the Warren bill that we're about to introduce, uh, is a bill that Tom, I believe, is familiar with. We we asked the Congressional Research Service what the cost of living increase should be this year. For those of you who depend upon Social Security, you probably heard that it was announced as being at zero this year because the price of gas went down, but that doesn't reflect how seniors spend their money. So I asked the Congressional Research Service, what should it be? They came back and said 2.9%. So if I've introduced a bill called the Seniors Deserve a Raise Act that gives seniors the full 2.9% that Congressional Research Service says they should have gotten if the cost of living adjustment had been calculated properly and then fixes that calculation in the future so that it corresponds to how seniors spend their bill money and not how other people spend their money, not how Donald Trump spends his money. That's so great. to show you how important this is, in the past 40 years, the per capita income in the United States has gone up by 7%. The purchasing power of Social Security benefits has gone down by 3%. Oh, wow. That, that is consequential. Deserve a raise. Yeah. And that's what my bill would do. Cool. Paul in Dallas, Texas. You're on the air with Congressman Alan Grayson. Well, I thank you very much. And uh, uh, Senator Grayson, I mean, uh, excuse me, Congressman Grayson, uh, you, I, you're one of my favorites. And, uh, I, uh, you know, the reason I'm calling is that, uh, you know, when I listen to you and your, your in-depth understanding of the issues, and uh, we certainly need a lot more people uh, like you that have an understanding of the issues like, like you're exhibiting right now. And we, we I don't think we do. I, it's, it, and I just wonder what you think we can do to get more messaging out there, to get more people to understand that Democrats like you are good for the Congress. And, and, and what can we do to get more candidates elected? Because unless we do, your great ideas, you, you're not going to get these nutbags and these birthers to vote for it. Uh, we, we, we need more people like you. What, what do you think we can do to get more people elected? Well, you can help to get me elected by going to my website, the modestly named SenatorWithGuts.com, uh, and helping our campaign, whether you make a contribution, whether you volunteer, uh, whatever it might be. Uh, just sign up for our emails. There's a lot of pleasure that people derive from reading our emails. We put a lot of thought, and a lot of, like Tom does his show. In fact, you could think of these emails as many... Tom Hartman shows uh, that we, where we try to elucidate an important issue and tell people what's going on. Beyond that, I think you're absolutely right. Well, the, the fundamental problem is we have Democrats who are afraid to be Democrats. I'm running against one who was a Republican until recently, and he wants the Democratic nomination for the Senate here in Florida. Uh, this is somebody who gave $2,300 to Mitt Romney's campaign and somehow thinks that he should be the Democratic nominee for the Senate. We have too many like that. And as Howard Dean pointed out years ago, when he was the head of the Democratic Party, you can't beat Republicans by being one. But we pay an additional price for that, because when people like that get elected, we end up with Republican policies, even when Democrats have the numbers and when they have the votes. And that's a shame. Look, I'm proud to be a Democrat, and I'm proud to push, push, push for progressive policies. I passed 31 amendments in the last two years in the House of Representatives controlled by the Republicans more than any other member, Democratic or Republican. And these are good, solid, progressive amendments. What I'm trying to demonstrate is that we Democrats and we progressives can win more than just elections. We can actually make changes to make the world a better place. And that's exactly what we need. John, in Marshall, Michigan, you're on the air with Congressman Alan Grayson. Hi, Tom. Congressman. Hey, John. 
I'm mired in uh, health care up to my eyeball. I've just recently had uh, a prostatectomy, and before that it was uh, melanoma. And um, I'm uh, not a very learned man, but uh, is there something that can be done to the Affordable Care Act to help people with health issues that are mired in such debt? That well, the, if I may answer your question, uh, the Affordable Care Act already does a lot to help in that situation. And specifically, what it does is it, it, it doesn't allow your insurance company to literally pull the plug on you when you become too expensive. Uh, it also makes sure that you can get coverage even if you're sick. There, these basic principles, which are now principles that people almost take for granted, uh, were not part of the law as recently as three years ago, uh, but became part of the law thanks to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, when, 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 you, uh, when you now become expensive to your insurance company, you have the right to get the care that you need. And all you need to do is simply pay the premiums, pay the deductible. And even if your care becomes extremely expensive, as cancer uh, care often does, as heart disease care often does, mm. then, in fact, you still get the coverage and you still benefit from it. My guess even is if, he, he might have had a high deductible policy. What is there any anything that people can do who are sitting on tens of thousands of dollars in health care debt as the consequence of that sort of thing? Well, uh, you know, th there are many people who had that situation. Uh, the leading cause of bankruptcy before Obamacare went into effect was, in fact, right. more than half of all bankruptcies was medical. That's care. right. Yeah. That, that's right. And that, uh, that has been alleviated to a large degree. But we have more to do. And I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. One thing I'm trying to do is to just simply open up Medicare to everybody who is willing and able to pay for it. Right. It turns out that that, that turn that's a very affordable form of care. Medicare recipients are generally very happy with it. Uh, you know, no, hardly anybody complains about uh, their Medicare coverage. And the fact is that we arbitrarily say that that's open to only one-sixth of the population. It's like saying, we'll build this interstate highway system, but we'll only let one-sixth of the population use it. Uh, and that's exactly the, what the Medicare system is. You can get coverage anywhere from Nome to Key West. Wow. And anywhere in between. And, and yet, you limit yeah. that to one-sixth of the population. That's great. You're listening to Tom Hartman. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. It's 15 minutes before the hour. We'll be back with more of your calls for Congressman Grayson right after this. And welcome back. Uh, let's see. Judy, watching Free Speech TV in Lewisburg, North Carolina. You are on the air with Congressman Alan Grayson. Yeah, hi. Um, I would like to know if there's any way you can put some kind of bill in. Um, I spent and saved my whole life. Let's say, for example, I had $50,000 in the bank. And over the last 10 years, if I had just a simple CD at 8%, that money would have made me $40,000. If I had a simple savings account at 5%, I would have had another $25,000. At $50,000, at 1%, I've lost tens of thousands of dollars that I have tried very hard to save, and I counted on that money. I, and I don't mind if there's something that went wrong that couldn't be helped. But i got to tell you, I feel like I got ripped off, that these bankers have taken my money, and that here I am left, you know, with what I got, and there's nothing I can do about it. Well, uh, I bear uh, the burden of being the only former economist to serve in the U.S. Congress, so let me give you an economic explanation of the phenomenon that you're describing, which is permanent low interest rates that are fundamentally different from any earlier point in your life or in my life. What's happening is that the chickens have come home to roost as a result of wealth and income inequality. And what I mean by that is that, especially in the United States, but also in other countries around the world, the wealthy are taking more and more income and have a greater share of our wealth. And the result of that is a very simple one. They're not spending what they're earning. In fact, that's one definition of how you actually get wealthy. You increase your net worth when you don't spend as much as you earn. So 
given the fact that we have more and more wealth in the hands of the wealthy, a greater and greater share of income in the hands of the wealthy, what we're seeing is chronic underperformance of the world economy and the U.S. economy because of a lack of aggregate demand. There simply isn't someone to buy the goods and services that are being produced that are creating this wealth in the hands of a small number. So the result of that is that we have uh, a, a, a Federal Reserve in charge of our money supply that is desperate to spur aggregate demand any way that it possibly can. Otherwise, we'd have mass unemployment, 10 percent, 15 percent, 20, 25 percent unemployment, simply because goods and services are being produced that aren't being bought. So what the Federal Reserve does is it institutes extremely low 0 percent interest rates for Wall Street, which then spills over to other parts of the economy in the hope that people can be encouraged to borrow and borrow and borrow and spend that money that they're borrowing on goods and services at lower interest rates so that the economy will not collapse. And that is where we are. Now, in order to change that system, what we probably have to see is we'd have to see uh, a revival of aggregate demand. We've been waiting now from 2008 to see that happen. It hasn't happened yet. Whether it will happen in the future is hard to say. But as long as we have a system, an economic system, that creates enormous wealth in the hands of a small number, and as long as those small number don't buy and spend as much as they make or earn or get, then what you're describing is a system that is hardwired into low interest rates and and undercompensates savers like you uh, in the hope that we can keep the economy alive. Wow. So it's all about inequality. That's thank you for teaching me something. Congressman Alan Grayson is with us. He'll be taking your calls for the next 10 minutes here on the Tom Hartman program. Stick around. We'll be right back. Congressman Alan Grayson on the line with us, taking your calls. And Barry in Chicago, listening to WCPT, you're on the air with Congressman Alan Grayson. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Grayson, thank you for being one of the good guys in our government. Um, thank you. I just wonder what you think. <laughs> thank you. Uh, the, the Democratic Party um, is, sort of has a schism right now between a Bernie Sanders wing that follows the progressive Democratic ideals that establish the party unequivocally, and the establishment wing, which thinks it's okay to go with the corporate money because you have to, and to move a little bit towards the right socioeconomically, or maybe more than a little bit, to win an election. And I wonder where you think that is headed for the Democratic Party. Well, uh, the, other, the other side, the corporate wing, is spouting foolish nonsense. I mean, I, it's hard. Everybody's picked a side. You know, the, the people who are undecided in elections remain undecided after the election. Uh, but, but the fact is that in Florida and in large parts of the country, there's the blue team and there's the red team. And uh, the, the, the red team votes no matter what. Uh, the blue team votes when it feels like it has a reason to vote. This is the fact of the matter. And what, when you uh, basically appease the Republicans uh, and appease corporate America and appease mu- multinational corporations and the fabulously wealthy by adopting policies for their benefit, even though you're nominally a Democrat, the fact is that you drain the ability of our, and the, 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 the desire of our side to vote. So it, it's an utterly flawed policy, and we've seen that in Florida now for a quarter century. We put one corporate dem after another after another up for statewide races, as opposed to, say, somebody like me. I'm, as far as I can tell, I'm the only labor union member ever to run statewide in Florida, and I'm a progressive Democrat, and I'm proud of it. Where has that other strategy gone? Well, it's failed over and over and over again. In fact, there's one person and one person only who's been a candidate in Florida that's won statewide twice in the last seven years, and his name is Barack Obama. Mm. And, and he's a liberal Democrat. So it galls me that, that, the, that these third wayers, that's what many of them call themselves, uh, go, go around the, the, and, and, and tell people that the way for Democrats to win is to imitate Republicans, when we've been doing exactly that, listening to them now for a long time, and what, where has it led us? It's led us to the point where we're down by 40 seats in the House, we're down by five seats in the Senate, 
they've had their chance, and their chance has led us to utter disaster. There's only seven states in the entire country now where the Democrats dominate the state legislature. There's over half of them where the Republicans dominate the state legislature. We've been devastated by corporate Democrats now uh, for a generation. And it's time for us to understand that in order for our voters to want to vote, we need to give them a reason to vote. And the only reason they're ever going to take from us is that we're true blue Democrats. I actually polled Democrats who didn't vote in Florida, who didn't vote last year, and I asked, why didn't you vote? And the most common answer I got from Democrats who didn't vote was that they couldn't see any difference between the candidates. Now, admittedly, last year we had an extreme example in Florida. We made the mistake of giving our Democratic nomination for governor to the former Republican governor. So we had the former Republican governor running against the current Republican governor. That certainly is an extreme example of this. But the fact is, for Democrats to win, we need to be Democrats. And and in in order for us to make that happen, progressive Democrats have to wake up, start fighting, win nominations, and then win the general election. There you go. John in Lake Placid, Florida. You're on the air with Congressman Grayson. Yes, hello. Uh, Congressman, uh, I have a question for you on uh, uh, Social Security taxation. In 1986, during the uh, Reagan tax reform days, uh, one of the methods to uh, uh, pay for the tax cuts for the wealthy was to start taxing Social Security benefits. To me, that's triple taxation, since uh, once you earn a dollar, you pay federal income tax, and then you pay your Social Security tax. And I think it's triple taxation to have to pay another federal income tax when you start collecting Social Security benefits. As a congressman, or hopefully as our next senator in Florida, would you introduce legislation to reverse that tax law? We're working on it right now. Uh, we, we have put together a, a Grayson Senior Platform. Uh, the first element of that is to extend Medicare to cover your eyes, your ears, and your teeth. I introduced a bill to do that a few months ago. We had 76 co Four. I, I've only been in Congress for five years, but I'll tell you, I've never seen a bill get 76 co-sponsors in two days before. That's how many co-sponsors we got for our seniors have eyes, ears, and teeth act. Our second bill, which I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, is to fix the COLA problem by giving seniors the 2.9% raise they should have gotten this year instead of the 0% raise they got under a broken, flawed system. That's called the Seniors Deserve a Raise Act. And we're working right now to introduce the third leg of this three-legged stool, uh, which is a bill that would eliminate the double taxation of Social Security benefits. You're absolutely right. Uh, you, You get taxed when you pay into the system, and then you get taxed again when the system pays out to you. That is utterly, utterly unjustifiable. And whether you're talking about a state like Florida, where we have so many seniors, or any other state, it's morally unjustifiable. And what we hear that this endless whining, whining from uh, the Republicans about how it's so unfair that we have taxation of capital gains, because somehow in their own minds they misconstrue that as double taxation. Well, here's an example of double taxation that applies to everybody who works and manages to live to the age of 65. And I don't see them doing anything about that, but we will. We'll introduce that bill. I'll do my best to get it passed, and grace and bills do move. Yeah, they do. Congressman, we have uh, 40 seconds left. Uh, you want to just give us some final thoughts for the week? Yeah, look, what this is all about next year is very simple. We bear the banners, Tom, you, you bear the banner, I bear the banners of justice, equality, and peace. And, and we're proud to do so. And what we need is that the whole Democratic team be proud to do so that we take Elizabeth Warren's lead and we stand up for what's right. That's what I'm going to be doing next year and next year's election. And I know that top politics is a team effort, so I'll be looking for a lot of other people to do the same. Mm-hmm. And, and, uh, and, and by the way, what, which of your websites do you, would you prefer people be re- referred to? Well, our campaign website is senatorwithguts.com. Our official website is grayson.house.gov. For those of you who want to learn more about trade, please come to tradetreachery.com. Uh, and whatever you do, please remain involved. It's the only way that we could possibly make things better. For Amen. goodness sake, you know, it, it, the people listening to your show are people with a conscience. They're people with a head and a heart. There you and go. Those are the people who need to change America. There you go. Congressman, thanks so much for being with us today. 
To watch more clips from our programs, hit the Watch More Videos button over here. And please be sure to hit the handy-dandy subscribe button so you'll always be up to date. Tag, you're it.